they're wonderful, aren't they? They can make you smile just, just looking at them. And they're also very important. So important, in fact, that many people would say that having a baby was the most important thing that ever happened to them. And they're right. They're right because even though you might not have given it much thought, making and having babies is a key process in evolution. In fact, Charles Darwin taught us that reproduction, this drive in us to make generations after generations of babies, it's the very engine of evolution. Now, it's been a while since we became a separate species from, from the apes, but during our time as Homo sapiens, well, we have evolved quite a bit. One relatively recent example is our ability to drink cow's milk. Now, that evolved as we domesticated cattle, and with cows all over the place, those of our ancestors who could drink cow's milk, well, they were better at having many babies compared to ones that couldn't take that source of nutrition. So you see, human evolution, it is ongoing, and it works, to put it a bit brutally, by allowing those people who are better adapted to whatever environment to make more babies than the other people in the same environment. And speaking of environments, Today, I'd like to focus on the environment for reproduction. And more specifically, I'd like to focus on the environment for reproduction in which this beautiful girl was made. You see, I work in assisted reproduction. I help people make babies, test tube babies, by IVF or in vitro fertilization, such as this beautiful girl in the light blue dress here. She is very pretty, don't you think? And surrounding her in this picture from the Share Fertility Institute is all the medication that her mother had to take in order to have her. And besides from this medication, there are also several other things that distinguishes the high-tech environment of assisted reproduction from the more traditional reproduction that Mother Nature has been using so far. For instance, some nine months and some weeks before this picture was taken, well, she looked a little bit more like this. Or rather, half of her did. This is a human sperm. And it's a human sperm that was not ejaculated into a vagina, as many sperm are, but it was ejaculated into a cup at my fertility clinic. And even though it moves, I can tell you, it is quite a lousy swimmer. And it would never have been able to, to find its way in some dark female genital organs. And also, it's not a very competitive type. Uh, it would easily lose the race if there were more sperm present. But this one, it doesn't have to race other sperm. All it has to do is to position itself around the edges of the Petri dish because that is where the lab technician first looks when the sperm sample is placed under a microscope. So the slow-swimming sperm along the edge, well, it becomes selected, picked up by a robotic arm on, with a needle on it, and then injected into the egg. Now, this egg here from the wife has also gone through a different selection process. What we see here is a video of how we treat eggs at my clinic. So this is right after we pick the eggs out of the wife and then we rinse them mechanically in and out of the pipette like that. And if you think it looks a little bit hard on the egg, well, you're probably right. And the egg, it has to survive this treatment in order to have a go at fertilization. And what about the fertilized egg? Is that any different? Well, this picture, it shows five fertilized eggs from one couple. And at this stage, they're called embryos. 
This is about 44 hours after fertilization, and that's the point in time where I have to decide which one of these do I transfer back into the woman, and which do I not. So, which one should I pick? Which one would you pick? Which one looks the most like the girl in the light blue dress? <laughs> I picked the prettiest one, okay? The one with four symmetrical cells 44 hours after fertilization. That has the highest chance of implanting and making the wife pregnant. So that gets to be transferred, whereas the other ones, well, I either put them in the freezer for later attempts, or I just throw them in the bin. Now, how brutal is that from the point of view of the embryo? I mean, if I was some IVF embryo, then I would do all that I could in order to be four symmetrical cells 44 hours after fertilization. But then again, if I was another embryo floating around inside some female genital organs, well, then I couldn't care less about how many cells I was 44 hours after fertilization, because no one would look. <laughs> I make babies differently. But do I make different babies? Yes, I do. I do because the selection processes that I use are so different, as I just showed you. I select different sperm, different egg, different fertilized egg, perhaps even different parents, because not all people can access IVF treatment. And I have to admit, we do not know what the evolutionary consequences are of injecting the slow sperm into the egg. And we do not know what genes we are selecting to die when we throw away all the asymmetrical embryos. What we do know is that some data indicates that IVF lowers sperm quality for the next generation of boys. And there are similar concerns for women. Now, we need more studies, but if these findings stick, then the 10 million people or so who have been born after assisted reproduction worldwide, they are at an increased risk of needing IVF themselves when they one day want to reproduce. IVF should therefore be seen as a prime example of how the human species is becoming biologically dependent on its own technology. Now, granted, not all children are IVF children, but still, 10% of all babies these days born in Denmark are born after assisted reproduction. In Norway, 5% and increasing. So these are significant numbers, and we have to remember it is the future of the human species that we're talking about here. But let's get some perspective. One, IVF children are healthy children. Yes, I have some concerns about their reproductive health, but in general, IVF is a very safe procedure for both children and parents. And second, modern medicine was always going to influence human evolution. Take the field of cancer treatment, for example, where it's well known in testicular cancer that if your father had testicular cancer, well, then you have an increased risk yourself for developing testicular cancer if you are a boy. And we have to be very clear on this. We must continue to treat testicular cancer, and we must continue to do IVF, even though it carries consequences for coming generations. And third, no. I don't think we're headed for a future where all human reproduction will take place by IVF. I mean, injecting a sperm into an egg at a fertility clinic does not necessarily mean that after 100 years of IVF, there will be no sperm left on the planet that can navigate a vagina. The woman on this picture is Louise Brown. 
And when Louise Brown was born in England in 1978, she was the world's first test tube baby. Now, today, Louise, she's 43 years old, just like myself, and she has a son, and the son is called Cameron. And Cameron, well, he was made the old-fashioned way. You see, I make babies differently so that more people can have them. You might say, I'm trying to make Mother Nature a little bit less brutal. And my message today is this. We, members of the human species, now find ourselves at a time where our technology is affecting our evolution. Yes, it is a bit daunting to be leading the hand of Mother Nature, but it's also a very privileged position to be in. So let's use that privilege as we seek to build a better, brighter future for our wonderful, wonderful babies. Thanks for listening.